I believe that if you're watching downstairs or online, it, this may be your fortunate Sunday. You don't have to see me. Our camera, I think, is, is uh, having some challenges this morning, so hopefully you can hear um, and uh, that uh, you don't put some other picture up in front of your screen. But for all of us, as we gather this morning, um, as we have talked about several times, uh, we, we, we're living in times that are kind of confusing, uh, clearly, with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the COVID has caused our world to change in so many ways, and, and it really, the, our world feels, you know, just upside down. And so when we come to times like Thanksgiving, and we, we come to our normal routines, and we, we so desperately want to go back to whatever normal was, it's in those times that we cause and reflect on our lives. Our, in our study of Ecclesiastes, what the preacher has been showing to us so vividly, and in some ways uh, almost too graphically for, for many of us, is that, that the world is broken. And so many of the, the ways that we look for meaning in our lives, so many of the things that we, we strive for are nothing but a vapor, or as he would say, meaningless, or, or it's vanity, striving after vanity. As one translator says, it's all smoke. And when our, when our lives face dilemmas like we do today, uh, we wonder, don't we, sometimes? Because what is our world? What makes up our world? Whoever would have thought that a, a pandemic would have, would have had these effects? Who would have ever thought of the dynamics that we've seen once again recently of, of racial tensions, political tensions, uncertainty in so many ways? So what's a, what's a Christian or what's a, a believer supposed to do in the middle of all this? Many Christians for out, out to history have responded in different ways. So many, when, when life gets all messed up and it gets upside down and, and things are just going crazy on us, they automatically conclude it must be that Jesus is returning, so let's just kind of pause on life and wait for Jesus. Others are what we would say like a deer in a headlight. When those challenges come our, our way, it just paralyzes us. And we don't know quite what to do. Well, this morning, we're going to read through 11 and 12 of Ecclesiastes. Don't worry, it's not that long. It won't scare you too bad. But let's read through these, and let's see what the preacher and ultimately what God has to say to us. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there will it lie. He, observes, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know, the way of the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. So you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice at them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many all that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days Come, and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease become because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and the terrors in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. 
before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity is of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given one by one shepherd. My son, be aware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we come and we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, especially so in light of the days that we're living, uh, we are so grateful that even though it was written thousands of years ago, that it's still alive. Even though we may not fully understand all the dynamics of it, it's still your word. And even though, Father, I may not preach it as clearly and distinctly as I'd like, your Holy Spirit comes and and makes it alive to us. But, Father, we rejoice that not only does your Holy Spirit make it alive, that that in some mysterious way your Spirit actually works and and graciously feeds us and even changes us as we hear it and apply it to our lives. So, Father, as we look at these words, once again, we pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray, Father, that I would not be a distraction. I pray that your spirit, even as I preach, would give me words to say. And and may all that I say this morning be to your honor and to your glory. And we pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. There are several things, basically three areas that I want to look at as we go through this chapter. And the first of it is to be bold. Oftentimes when we get get into life and trials get difficult and and we're not quite sure what to do, we pause, as I mentioned earlier. But we can recognize that when we recognize as believers in Jesus Christ who God is and what He's called us to, we can live our lives boldly. We can go on with life. I know many have had questions even in our day to say, what do we do with with the uncertainty of, 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 of our economy? What's going to be the impact of COVID? What's going to be the impact of, of, of how, the pres- how, how our future even falls out with, with the political climate that we're in? And all those things sometimes can just cause us to stop. But, but, but these, the struggles that we go through are nothing new. They may be new to us, but they're not new to humanity. And so what the preacher tells us is so powerful in this context that we live in. And that in spite of the risks and the challenges and the uncertainties that we have, we're to go on with life and business. Notice in verse 1, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Some have seen that as to give our money away and be generous and to give to those who have need. And, and, and it, that could be the case, but, but when we look at this chapter as a whole, the preacher is saying that life may be meaningless, it may be uncertain, but he's not calling us to do nothing. He's pointed that out through the entire book. Just because life may seem meaningless, it may be vanity, doesn't mean that we just give up. And what he's actually calling us to is to continue to gauge and trade. And literally, in this context, continue to invest, engage in maritime trade. Bread stands for trade. And the very tripper Longman writes, the idea of this verse then is that as people engage in trade, profits may flow back to them. Risk is involved, but reward may come. Continue to live life. Continue to do your work when you have it. Continue, as we'll see, is to go about the work of the kingdom, because that's what we've been called to do. Verse 2, he says, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. Again, the portion there is tied back to the word bread in verse 1. And again, uh, Dr. Longman goes on, the force of this, of this advice is to diversify one financial's financial at risks. If one or two go under, there are other investments that will come through. In other words, realizing that we just don't give up, we continue to live life, invest in life. 
You may not be able to have the finances to invest in the, in the stock market, but we can invest in life, and we can invest in different areas of life, recognizing that we need to continue to trust God even in the uncertain times. Let me correct that. We need to learn to trust God in the uncertain times because He never changes. Verses 3 and 4 remind us not to stress over what we can't control. You can't control the rain. It's inevitable. It's going to rain. We can't control when it wants to rain. And think about this in the light of a farmer. He wants it to rain. He or she wants it to rain when it's convenient. Obviously, you want it to rain after you've planted your seeds. And there's anxiety, there's stress when you've planted, invested in, in putting seeds in the ground. It doesn't grow. You can't control when or where a tree falls in the forest. It's random in so many ways. So it's like we can't sit and figure out what trees are going to fall in this world around us. You can't control those things. If you spend your time, notice that in verse 4, watching the wind, and again, the idea here is you're looking to see as you sow the seeds, because remember, sowers in those days literally cast the seeds. So if you have a windy day, your seeds are, are, you know, are, are not going to go where you wanted to. The other day, as many of you in the process of the fall duties that we have, is to get the leaves out of our yard. Uh, every once in a while, it works perfectly. The wind blows the direction you're trying to blow with your blower or rake, Right? So he's like saying, don't stand out there and wait for the wind to go the direction you want your leaves to go. <laughs> You've got to try to rake them anyway. Because if you sit and wait for that perfect time, you, you can't control the wind. At the same time, you can't study it and try to figure out, you know, when, when it's going to rain or, you know, when it's, you know, the rain. So that, the, you know, that, that again, that there's, a, there's an aspect of the rain. You can't control that either. So don't stress over that time. Don't spend your time watching the rain. Don't spend your time studying the clouds. And again, afraid, the other end is afraid to far harvest because of the rain, and it may keep you from harvesting. You won't get a good harvest. Verse 5 reminds us to accept the mystery of a sovereign God. You don't know the way of the wind. And that recognizing there in antiquity and history, the, the childbirth was a mystery. Um, there's still a level of mystery to us today, but we have, we've understood things. But them, they didn't understand how, a, how the bones of a baby were formed in a womb. You didn't understand that, but accept it as a mystery and as a way of God sovereignly working in ways that you can't even see. So we also must ex accept, again, the activity of God, even when it doesn't make sense, and that God is in control of all things. Verse 6 reminds us to go on with life, trusting in God. So in the morning, you know, sow your seed. And keep working, and even so again in the evening, continue to work, trusting that God is going to work, even though you may not know, and even though the outcome may not be as you'd like it to be. So the first point the preacher is making clear to us is to go on with life. As we sang earlier, to sow our seeds, trusting in God's hand, recognizing that even if it doesn't go the way we want it to, we can still rest in God's hands. But underneath this boldness is the hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's our challenge, first of all, physically, to live our lives, continue to live our lives as we can. Secondly, as believers in Jesus Christ, live our lives in light of the gospel, recognizing that even in challenging times, in a broken world, it's a golden opportunity, a perfect opportunity to sow the seeds of the gospel. Secondly, in verses 7 through 10, he reminds us to be joyful. Notice verse 7, life or light is sweet. It's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Uh, most of us, we enjoy those days when we, in the fall when we're surprised <laughs> that it's warm and sunny. It's, it's fascinating. You go out, you get a warm, like, like Friday specifically, Friday afternoon was so sunny, you go out, and in our neighborhood, the whole neighborhood's out enjoying the sunshine, and everybody's thinking the same thing. You say, hey, beautiful day. What do they say? Enjoy it while you can, right? Because they know winter's coming. In the same way, the preacher is saying is, is recognizing and enjoy life like it is light and recognizing that it's a gift from God. Because if you live long, many long years, you know, uh, you won't be able to rejoice in all of them because there will be dark days. And he says, oftentimes all that comes is vanity. It seems hopeless. We also recognize in verses 9 through 10 that those specifically who are young rejoice in your youth. Now, all of us are young, right? A little bit. But what he's saying there is, what you, you know, let your heart or your mind cheer you in the days of your youth. 
recognizing. We realize in, in so many ways as, as we do get older, our, our, our bodies change. We face more challenges as we're going to see here in a little bit. But in the moment you are, regardless of where you are, recognize that. Enjoy the days that you have, the j- days of good health. Notice into verse 9. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. Verse, and then again, the 9c, but know all of these things. God will bring you into judgment. I don't believe he's saying just go out and party while you're young because you won't be able to do it when you're old. I don't believe that's what the preacher is saying. He's not saying to college students go out and live, just live as wild as you can because one day you're going to have to settle down and be responsible. Because when we recognize that so often the Old Testament, the heart wasn't the center necessarily of emotion. There was also a process of thinking through it. Think through your life. Enjoy your life, but enjoy it in light of the fact that, as we see the verse 9, that you know that all things will, God will bring into judgment. And the preacher brings that back to us at the end of chapter 12. So the point is rejoice responsibly. Remove vexation or anger from your heart and put away every evil or pain from your body because childhood and the prime or the dawn of life is fleeting. For all of us in this room, we have to be so careful that what we don't do is, I will rejoice when I get to this point in my life. I will will start enjoying life at this point and we don't enjoy every precious moment that's given to us here on earth. For all the years in Florida, I can't tell you how many times there were those who lived for retirement, saved for retirement. That was their dream, only to get to Florida and pass away or face an illness, a crippling illness, and and have a stroke or something. And and I remember talking to them. They go, this is not what I lived for. And as a pastor, I want to say, I wish this wasn't what you had lived for. Enjoy the present. And I will say to all of us in this room today, you can enjoy life in the middle of all the circumstances that we're facing today. And I can say that because I've seen believers in the world who face far, far, far more than we do, delighting and rejoicing in the graciousness and the love and the compassion of God. So in the middle of all, we are to rejoice. Then as we move into chapter 12, we're called also to be godly. Our life matters. Verse 1, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And remember isn't just a recollection. (laughs) Like, oh yeah, I think I remember where the so-and-so lives. No. The remembering, as we see throughout throughout the Old Testament, is is a trust, is a committing ourselves to God. We see that, you know, one example is Deuteronomy 8.18, but it's throughout the Old Testament. Remembering is a commitment, is, 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 is committing to glorify and honor and enjoy God while we have the ability to do it. That's profound. Do this, as he says there, before the evil days come and years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Enjoy God now because you don't know what the future is. And where he's going with this is you're also getting older. (laughs) Some of us know that better than others, don't we? Yes, we can't do what we used to do. And every once in a while we try to do what we used to do and it doesn't turn out like we'd like it to. That's the challenges we face. In verses 2 through 5, the teacher then goes on, the preacher goes on and gives a creative picture of the effects of aging through an allegory or a picture of a grand old house that's falling into decay. Before he does so, he reminds verse 2, he says, Old age is a cold, rainy day when clouds cover the sun, light, moon, and stars. In other words, it's just a, there's, a, there's a dark side to it, and he's purposely saying this. Not to say, to, not to depress everybody. This is great as we get older, but to remember and to reflect on the days that we've been given. Notice this picture of the old person, again, compared to the old house. Keepers of the house tremble. More than likely, he's talking about the muscles and the weakening of the body. Uh, again, those of you over, uh, what, 40, I guess it is, you're already experiencing that a little bit. Strong men are bent. They're stooped over. The grinders cease because they are few. Anybody want to guess what that is? Loss of teeth. Now, we don't worry about that much, but in antiquity and in other parts of the world, when you lose your grinders, it becomes a problem, right? We can get them replaced and get prettier ones than we had in the first place, but not then. It's a recognition of, of, of again, the challenges of growing old. Those who look through the windows are dim. Loss of sight. 
And notice verse 4, the doors on the streets are shut when the sounds of the grinding is low and all the daughters of our song are brought low. You can't hear as well. We also, one rises up at the sound of the bird, sleeplessness. Anybody experiencing that? They're afraid also of what is high and the terrors are in the way. You know, the fear of falling, the fear, again, of, of the, recognizing both your mental and your, your physical deterioration. Again, as I've cared for loved ones in the past, it's hard to see someone as they get older and, it's, and, and they, the challenge of walking and trying to keep them safe. The almond tree blossoms, again, speaking to the almond tree that has white, white hair. The grasshopper drags itself along, walking with a limp. And desire fails. And some of your translation will say the caper berry, which is an aphrodisiac. You see, loss of virility as they grow old. All of a sudden you realize that who you are in life is gone. So remember your creator because we are well on our way to our eternal home and the mourners go about the street in 5b. Remember your creator. See, he's painting such a sober picture of our lives and and where we're going and what we're struggling with. And he comes back again, remember your creator before the silver cord is snapped. And some of these pictures are a little bit hard, but again, you know, a silver chain that is broken, representing life. Before the golden bowl is broken, another picture of of a beautiful bowl just being broken and falling to pieces like the body that dies. Before the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, before the wheel, again, at the cistern is broken and there's no way to bring life or water from the well. And in verse 7, and dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. You see, that's the picture of we were created it from dust and to dust humanity will return. So be godly in the middle of all this recognizing we have a certain number of days we don't know what those days are but our lives are to be ones where we are to strive forward we're to move boldly ahead trusting in god rejoicing in his goodness and rejoicing what regardless what our circumstances are but also living a life that honors and glorifies him verses 9 through 14 of chapter 12 it calls it the end of the matter, doesn't it? And this is in many ways kind of an epilogue to this book, and it, it changes. Notice it looks back. It isn't the author teaching. He's speaking of the author. But the preacher's words are described and evaluated in verse 9, 10. We recognize as we look back over the book, he was wise and taught people knowledge. He pondered and searched and arranged many proverbs. And 1 King 4.32 tells us that Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs. He sought to find delight in words and and using the words truthfully and correctly. He was indeed a scholar. The words of the wise in verse 11 through, then there's a call to us after, again, as he brings this book to a close. And he reminds us that the words of the wise, and, and not only do we see it in this book, but I want to encourage you that Scripture itself is the words of the wise. They are like goads or cattle prods moving us to action. You see, Scripture and hearing Scripture taught and preached and, and understanding it is a catalyst, catalyst to us to, be, to move into action. My prayer even this morning as we think of this book and in the middle of the circumstances that we are, that it will be a prod to us to move us into action. I have farmers in my family and in my wife's family, and I, I have been able to, as, as, a, as a high school student, I got to play with a cattle prod. Um, I won't go into detail on it, but a cattle prod is, is a long, long uh, mechanism that at the end has two electronic parts on it, right? The idea is when those two metal pieces hit the cattle, or oftentimes my uncle was a hog farmer, the hog that you need to get into that trailer, it would give him a little zap. It would shock him into moving forward and hopefully not coming back at you. That's what a, that's what a cattle prod is. The goads were the same essence is to move them forward. And don't we all need cattle prods in our lives? We're so prone to apathy. We're so prone to be paralyzed when our world isn't going the way we want it to. 
but yet we've been so graciously given Scripture to remind us that we have a God who's gracious, good, and kind, and sovereign. So live boldly. Rejoice in what you've been given. Rejoice in your relationship with Him. Rejoice in His sovereignty and live a life that honors and glorifies Him. The wisdom that we see in Scripture and we've seen here in Ecclesiastes is like nails. They give stability to a life that seems so unstable. We see that time and time again of God's Word being the foundation that that nail us to that firm foundation that we find in Jesus Christ. Do you feel in many ways that your world is unstable? Are you feeling (laughs) a higher level of instability? Then I want to ask the question, how much are you spending time in God's Word and how much time are you spending in prayer? I can't tell you how many times, you know, every, every once in a while, but twice in my life I get stressed out about something. That's a, I'm, I'm, that's a joke. If I didn't spend time in God's Word regularly and regularly and let it soak into my heart, th- I, I would just either try to work 24 hours a day or just drive myself to a, a stressful heart attack. Because part of the life of being a pastor is I see everybody's lives. I see the world around me. I I bear responsibilities like all of you bear responsibility. You have family. You have people around you who you care for. And you can't change those circumstances. Don't I wish there was a magic pill that I could get that would solve and, and heal broken marriages? That would have bring, take this pill, son, because you, as soon as you take it, you'll come to Je- you'll, you'll, you'll believe in Jesus and you'll love him the rest of your life. Don't we wish that there were magic things? Like, there aren't. But we boldly have to come and trust in God's word. And it is God's word and letting it soak in our lives and praying that the Holy Spirit will apply it to our lives that nails my feet to the ground spiritually and refocuses me. And I want to tell you it's in a unique way. It isn't just because I've studied scripture all these years. It's because the Holy Spirit makes it alive in my heart and gives me hope and gives me stability and oftentimes prods me forward in life. Because you see, as we see, they are given by the shepherd. Is the word of God given to us. See, the preacher recognizes that he, that, that he will not be the last word. And there's going to be a lot of other things written, but he also warns us to be careful of all those other things that are written because in much study causes weariness. And I want to tell you, we've got a lot of information, don't we? A lot of bad information that's available to us. But we do know that in the 66 books of the Bible that are contained, that we can trust in the Word of God. The end of the matter, verses 13 and 14. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the duty of humanity. Again, recognizing that fear isn't being terrified of God. It's a trusting in God. It's a resting in God. It's a following in God. It's starting with receiving faith in, 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 in Jesus Christ as forgiveness for our sins. Recognizing our need for that forgiveness. Recognizing our need for His help in life. Because it's through Jesus Christ that we're brought into that relationship. with. That's the beginning of our fear in God but it also means an ongoing obedience to Him. That's our primary duty. That's what drives us to be bold in how we live our lives, regardless of what our calling is. That's, what, that's the basis of our joy when, when life is, was hard. That's what gives us thanksgiving when it's a hard thanksgiving. That, that's what gives us a whole thrust in our lives is our fear and our trust in God. It is not only our duty, it's our blessing. In verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil there's that revealing revealing truth of the gospel yesterday we had a presbytery meeting somewhere down in in the boonies in south georgia fairton i think it was and driving back i you know start playing through my prayer my prayer list i promise you won't tell anybody but but i i like to listen to ricky skaggs okay that's from my time in georgia in tennessee but he's got a couple gospel songs, and one of them it goes, Oh, sinner, you better get ready. Oh, you better get ready. Hallelujah. Sinner, you better get ready. There's a time a-coming when the sinner must die. And he could sing it in a way that I wouldn't even try to do. But what a powerful lesson to us is to live our lives. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we all face death. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, 
all the truths of aging, we go through them with the blessing and the strength and the power of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of where you are in your life today, even if you are that old house <laughs> or you begin to feel your old house fall apart, God gives you strength in all those places. Be bold in your life. Live life fully. Rejoice. And live a life that honors and glorifies God's. Because after all, that is our chief end, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, these are words that dig and drive deep into our hearts. Uh, Father, we are all fearful or paralyzed, discouraged. It's so easy to be grumpy. It's so easy to be so frustrated by all the things that seem to be going wrong this season. And Father, in the midst of that, when we're locked in our houses, when we're restricted and we're told what we can and we can't do, Father, it's hard to be godly. Whether in the privacy of our homes or in our hearts, we desperately need your grace. So Father, it's so good to know that we don't, we don't just do this stuff by trying harder, that your Holy Spirit strengthens us. You graciously help us. So as we go into another week, we pray that you, your Spirit, would give us boldness, give us joy. And give us the strength to live lives that honor and glorify you and point others to the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.